when you were defending these high level people, were there any attempted attacks on them? There was one um, during the day. Wow, during the broad daylight. Broad daylight, but they have such a, I mean, they had such a protection detail militia outside of the US. Like Trump has teams just monitoring him 24 seven, right? Yeah. So you yeah. were probably like undercover and people didn't even know. I think I stuck out a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, I think I stuck out a little bit there. And I mean, they knew it was early in the war um, in 05. And so, I mean, they, they knew who we were. Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests and it helps us grow the team. Truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting. And here's the episode. All right, guys, we got Cole Fackler here today, founder of GBRS Group. Thanks for coming on, man. I oh, appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, we were just talking about surfing. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's one thing I've done the longest. Uh, I just turned 40 last February, but I, ever since I can remember, I've been in the ocean surfing probably since I was like four or five. Wow. So you yeah. grew up in Virginia. Did they have waves out there? Hurricanes. Hurricanes, <laughs> uh, storms, definitely chasing all those is what creates a surf on the East Coast. But I grew up swimming competitively. Mm. And with Pisces, so lo love the water, love the ocean, and can't get enough of it. Damn. Right. Uh, what's the biggest wave you've caught? Biggest wave I caught uh, was, I was in, say, 2012. I was on the north shore of, of Hawaii, uh, a place called Log Cabin. So it's about a mile offshore of, from Pipeline. Mm. Legendary break. And um, we're actually out there uh, doing some training. And the surf got big enough. The Eddie I Cal almost went on. It was right in that time window uh, for that big wave contest at, at, in Waimea. But we ended up doing some towing surfing. Um, the legend, Ken Bradshaw, he was one of the pioneers in towing surfing. Mm. I was out there with him and got towed into like a 45-foot wave. Holy crap. Yeah. So what, is, what exactly is towing surfing? Uh, it's where a jet ski pulls essentially, you know, a wakeboard boat type um, rope. And you have a board strapped onto you and you get enough speed and get towed into a big wave. That is crazy. And you're a mile out of the shore. Yep. So you can't even. I mean, there's a lot of jet skis. There's a lot more training that go into it. It's not just get a jet ski, yeah. get a rope and a tow board and jump <laughs> out there. No. I mean, these guys are legends, like professionals that have been doing it their entire lives. That's insane. I mean, 45 feet, dude. That is seven times my height. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of pros out there that day. Um, Cole Christensen, John John Florence. I was just lucky enough to be out there. That wave hadn't broke in about eight years. No way. Yeah, so it Holy takes a certain size swell, um, and it doesn't happen every year. So. Wow, so a lot goes into it to get to that point. Yeah, I mean, everything from being comfortable in the ocean to your team, procedures that you wipe out, what to expect, people mm. to pick you up. And, you know, it's, it's progressed a lot in the safety equipment um, from jet skis to – Flotation and everything else. Nice. Would you say you're a bit of an uh, ad adrenaline junkie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely adrenaline junkie. I like pushing my limits. Yeah, you like that moment of like your your life's on the line almost. Yeah, not recklessly. <laughs> uh, definitely mitigating some of the risk uh, with, with the training, but I definitely like pushing my limits. I was always from a young kid, always searching for a bigger wave, bigger wave, bigger mm. wave, and I just like enjoy that. it. So that's that mindset kind of took you to the military then, right? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, I grew up competitively swimming year round and just always, um, was super motivated and training hard and being the best I could. And I'm a sore loser, so I didn't like, like losing. Um, but being a part of, you know, a high performing team was what pushed me in the military. Mm. Um, the, the patriotism I was in, I was in high school as a senior in high school, uh, in history class when nine 11 happened. Oh, wow. I watched it, watched it on TV. Dang. And it was hard to grasp uh, what we were watching and seeing. So that was that was a part of the driving force to go in the military. The patriotism being something bigger than yourself. Mm. Uh, being a part of the American um, dream and protecting it. Uh, everything from freedom of speech to pr providing protection just for every American. Mm. It was that terrorist event. You know, a lot of people lost families and we wanted to make it right. But just, again, protect the U.S. from the terrorism. Yeah, that event was such a catalyst. So many stories of people joining the military after that happened. Yeah. So what was it like when you joined? Was it an immediate fit or did it take some adjusting? So I graduated high school about eight months prior to going in into the Navy. It was a pretty...
Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? Well, click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below, and here's the episode, guys. Straight shot, went through boot camp up at Great Lakes. Mm. Uh, at that point, we had to go to a, a Navy rating school. So briefly went to San Antonio for two weeks before getting to Coronado and going to BUDS, which is basic underwater demotion seal training, um, where the, the notorious hell week goes on yeah, and, yeah. and all that. So it was it was a pretty straight line um, from going in to getting to BUDS. And I was lucky enough going through BUDS. I didn't get injured, didn't get rolled back. Mm. Uh, and that, that happens from time to time. Um, but there's nothing um, more enjoying to be in California on the beach going to buds. <laughs> yeah. How many started your hell week and how many ended? We had roughly 180 ish people start, start mm. in our buds class. And I say 22 originals finished. Wow. So from that, you know, 180 ish originals, 22 finished. There were some from classes ahead of us that rolled back into our class, whether it's injury or, or failing, one of the key mark tests. Yeah. So they had a little experience. Yeah. Wow. So only about 10, 15% passed. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. very low. Yeah. Is it usually physical? They can't keep up with the physical side of things or is it more mental? Uh, I, I say it's more mental than physical. They'll get you physically ready. It's it's more the mental side and and not quitting and getting through it. Mm. So, I mean, there was everybody from middle Kansas to Alaska and every other state with every other kind of background. Wow. Single parent, married parents, brothers, single kid. Um, a lot of wrestlers did good. Mm. Um, but every different walk, life build, um, and people that may not physically look like they'd pass, they pass. Interesting. That that mental toughness really is, is what gets you through it. Yeah, that must have been interesting for you to meet all sorts of people because you grew up in Virginia your whole life, right? Yeah. So you didn't really talk to other people. No, I mean... I competitively swimming and, and competing growing up. I did some traveling, nothing too far west from Virginia. Yeah. But a lot of up and down the East Coast. Okay. So you were really good at swimming. I was. Yeah. I swam year round for probably from when I was six all the way up until I was about 15. Dang. Had a shoulder surgery when I was 14. I mean, we were swimming year round roughly say over 100,000 yards a week. Holy crap. So you were a distance swimmer? I was a sprinter. Oh, you were. A lot of our practices, you know, we'd swim 10, 15,000 yards of practice. But I was, I, I was in the same year group with Michael Phelps. Oh, God. And him growing up in Maryland, you know, swam against him and um, grew up around a lot of greats. Yeah, that's legendary. Did you see him rising to that level? I didn't realize that at the time. It took my mom to tell me, she's like, you, you swam against him. I was like, I did? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know. Like, oh, you didn't even know? No, 14, 15. And that age, like, it, you know, you don't know. Um, we're both that age. And he went on to do great things. Yeah. You know. He had the perfect genetics for it, plus the work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. I was always competing against those six foot plus guys that were like 12, 13. They yeah. had the good genes. So they have an extra inch on you every single time they. Yeah. It didn't discourage me. <laughs> uh, my dad always said someone out there is always training harder than you, longer than you. That was just the motivation. I had this like Rocky theme in my head. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. I love that, man. Any other sports you played? I mean, I grew up, I, I was very fortunate. I got to play a lot of different sports, uh, lacrosse, baseball, basketball, name it, instruments. Mm. Played violin for like 10 years. Yeah? yeah. Okay. 10 years is a long time for an instrument. Yeah. I didn't last that long. No. So I was, I was lucky um, with the exposure that I got. It's only child too. Yeah. You got a good mindset, man, because instruments were tough for a lot of kids in my school. None of us made it past like two years. Yeah. No, I, I enjoyed it. And hopefully one day I pick it back up. Yeah. I'd love to see that, man. I tried doing the trumpet. Yeah. It just grossed me out, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> like your spit's literally in that. Well, I played the alto sax for a while. And yeah. Yeah. It's gross, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. Like that long tube. You got to clean it. Nope. Yeah. I'm yeah. good with that, man. Um, so how long did after you joined the military, did you start getting deployments and stuff like that? So went in 2003, uh, showed up to the East Coast at SEAL Team 10 in, in 04. Her first deployment was 2005. It was a pretty quick turn. Oh, wow. Yeah, graduated BUDS and went went straight over to Team 10. We jumped into a workup where you hit a number of skills and training trips leading up to those deployments. Mm. Where'd you get sent to? Iraq. Oh. Yeah. 
Do you remember that pretty pretty vividly, arriving and stuff? Yeah. Um, we were in a big C, C5 hmm. where that nose opens up. Yeah, in the movies you see those, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, the picture in our head was like, we have to be prepared to get off the airplane and get into a gunfight immediately. And that's wow. Not, that's not what it was <laughs> when we landed by any means, but a, a big C5 kind of dive bombing down. Um, so no, you know, ground fire would hit it, um, it right into Baghdad. And we had all our gear prepped and stuff like that, but it wasn't like that. Mm. I mean, you could, there was definitely a different smell you could hit about like 4,000 feet, smell a little different, just open sewage and different stuff. Oh, wow. Um, but we, we went there and did some protection detail stuff for the presidents, PMs, prime mm. ministers, and, uh, got a lot of exposure, direct action missions, um, where you hit different targets, did some stuff with Jocko. Nice. Uh, we, we were kind of spread out somewhat. Um, main base was in Baghdad, but kind of went out west, linked up with the West Coast guys. So we we're all East Coast, even numbers, West Coast, odd numbers out of San Diego. And there were, there were probably a handful of different SEAL teams. And so it was busy. Um, wow. So every day was like you didn't know what to expect. It was a new thing. I mean, it was either it was a bounce between protection detail and the prime ministers, presidents are doing nighttime mm. type direct, shot, direct action raid missions. When you were defending these high level people, were there any attempted attacks on them? There was one um, on Talibani d during the day. Wow, during the broad daylight. Broad daylight, but they have such a, I mean, they had such a protection detail, militia outside of the US, um, people that were there, uh, his protection detail got all into it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he had a team and then you guys were just kind of monitoring that team? monitoring and kind of more central closer to him mm. so it was kind of a whole exterior force that they had and uh they got into it dang that's intense yeah you don't realize like trump has teams just monitoring him 24 7 right yeah so you yep. were probably like undercover and people didn't even know i think i stuck out a little bit there. <laughs> yeah i think i stuck out a little bit there and i mean they knew it was early in the war um in 05 and so i mean they they knew who we were got it how, how many years were you there uh, and the SEAL teams? In Iraq. Combined. So we went back in 07, back in 09. In Iraq, it was probably a combined two and a half years wow. of, of deployments. You got sent back multiple times. Yeah. So did 11 deployments total. Damn. Um, throughout the, I got medically retired after 17 and a half years. Um, but between Iraq, Afghanistan, and a few others, um, it was a lot, but I, Iraq was about two and a half years. Afghanistan, probably a year and a half or two. Holy crap. 11 is um, the most I've heard. It was busy rotations. Like there was a cycle that it was just, you knew where you're going 24, 16, 24 months out. And then mm. there were some other um, depl unpl unplanned deployments that we had to do. That must be tough because you're at yeah. home and with your family and they just say, oh, you're getting sent off again. Yeah, it is. It, it's extremely tough. Uh, especially when you can't, can't tell them where you're going to go. Oh, you're not allowed to tell? On some of them. There, wow. there were definitely some things that you know we couldn't. Where it's like, I'll call you. Damn. I don't know when I'll call you, but I can call you. That's crazy. At, your own, at some point. Your own family. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. I didn't know it was like that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, when I was at SEAL Team 10, there for roughly six years, and then went to a selection process to kind of the, the special mission unit um, at Development Group. And went through that selection and then spent another seven years there and then got medically retired. Mm. And even at the at that unit, we did a number of deployments, a little bit faster cadence. Got it. So I didn't know there's stuff past the Navy SEAL. I thought that was... No, it's all part of the SEAL teams. Um, Naval Special Warfare Development Group is kind of um, just another step up from that. And going through the selection process there again... Um, is, is definitely tough and not everybody makes it through, uh, but super funded and they, they do a lot of good stuff. I was, Interesting. Lucky, I was lucky to make it. Was that tougher than Hell Week? It was in the sense of you're just as tired physically, mentally, but they want you to make decisions that will result in people's lives. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. High pressure stuff. Yeah. And Bud's is more, I say, physically taxing. I mean, although I said mental is, is the tough, the biggest part of it but bud you show up with the right stuff you do what they ask you to do and you get through and i don't want to make it sound that simple but yeah 
It is. Uh, going through that other selection, it's way more pressure. Wow. Um, it, it's like the next step. Almost like if you went up for like the NFL draft and everybody's got your eyes on you, but you have to do all these different tests and how you rank out, and they can cut you at any point. Mm. So it's like that. So it can be a big ego blow too if you don't make it. Interesting. I mean, everybody knows who makes it and doesn't make it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't hide it, right? No. <laughs> uh, that, that's what uh, happened with Dan Bozarian, right? Yeah, I'm not fully sure on his story. I know he made it through Buds. I'm not sure. His I think he got career, injured or something, yeah. and then they found out through the medical records. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think a typical, like, I don't know, college athlete could pass Buds training? D1? Yeah, I'm sure they could. Um, on the schedule that you have to perform, I'm not sure. Mm. I mean, I would like to say yes, but there's a lot of people that surprise you that – just mentally, they're right. they quit because you can't factor that in yeah. the physical side, like you said. Yeah. I mean, probably. yeah, D one athlete could pass kind of. I say the standards. Yeah, but just the day in day out, and like it's not just the physical standard standards. It's it's everything else. Yeah, I remember when my dad. My dad was in the navy actually, so he would try to get me to join, but I couldn't do the pull ups and the push ups, dude. Yeah, those were hard. Yeah. I was a twig in high school. I was one hundred thirty two pounds. Uh, my best friend DJ, he literally was like one thirty. Like 130. Oh, he's 17 too. Like yeah. him and I were 17, 18. So it's hard to hurt 17, 18 year old. But I mean, he, he was skinny. Now he walks around like 240 and jacked. Wow. Yeah. yeah I was picture this. Cause I was 130 pounds, but I'm also six, five. So I was literally a twig. Like yeah. I was a track runner distance. Yeah. And I just couldn't even do like 10 push-ups in high school. It was pathetic. Or two pull-ups. Start, you gotta start somewhere. <laughs> I know. Right? Yeah. That's all. You but what somewhere. was the minimum you need to do? Like, I think 50, they said 50 push-ups and 10 pull-ups. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't get there. I, I don't even know if I could do it now, man. Hey, there's some running too, but the running would be easy for me. I would I hate running. Really? I hate swimming was easy. You do those two mile ocean swims every week. Yeah. I grew up also doing some triathlons with my parents and, and that kind of thing. So open ocean water wow. was good. Triathlon. That, that was just re relaxing. Yeah. It wasn't worried That'd about it. That'd be probably the hardest for most people though, the swimming part. Yeah. Two miles in open ocean. So you can't even drop out if you wanted to. I mean, there's definitely guys that quit on the swims. Wow. I mean, there's safety boats and things. Yeah. But yeah. I heard, I don't know which branch of the military was, but they make you go underwater and then you, some people pass out or something. That's part of Buds. Oh, it you is? You have to do a 50 meter underwater swim. That's where you'll meters. see guys like start to pass out at the end. And there's instructors that basically are guiding you, watching you there and wow. grab you. But for you, you probably did it without passing out. Yeah. You had the swimming background? Yeah, my swimming background. My first 50 meter underwater, I did when I was 10. Dude, that's a whole, uh, like. Yeah, like the Olympic size pools. 50 yeah. Meter. I don't know if I could do that in one shot, man. That is intense. Wow. Somewhere. I used to yeah. dive to the bottom of the pool. Yeah. 13 feet for fun. Yeah. Touch the floor it's and fun. come back up. Yeah. <laughs> the risks we took as kids. Yeah. <laughs> Missed yeah. those days, those innocent days, you know? Just, you don't know how close we all of us were into uh, probably dying. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You ever miss the, that innocence though? I do. And I try and preserve it in my kids. Yeah. I, I try and preserve it so they can ha be creative and fun and no, no rush into this world. I remember people always saying, don't rush to grow up. It's like, I don't want them to rush to grow up. Yeah. I feel that. Do you feel like you grew up kind of quick? No. Um, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a mixture of, of growing up. Um, I think the discipline that a lot of the sports, um, I got out of a lot of the sports. Probably had me grow up a little a little quicker mm. than normal. Yeah, um, that's the thing when you pursue professional level sports, right? You got yeah. to start at an early age and you give up some freedom. Yeah. I mean, my practice, I was doing eight practices a week. Holy. So there God. are doubles during the week. Yeah. yeah. And I was lucky enough that my parents would take me to 5 a.m. practices. 5 a.m. Damn. That is early. Yeah, yeah, high school started at 7. So you were doing it before school started. Mm -hmm. You were committed, man. Yeah. Is that, did you want to become like a professional swimmer? That, that was that was definitely a goal um, at one point to try and make it to the Olympics and go that route. After my shoulder surgery, I, I got exposed to high school and women. Mm. <laughs> <Distractions>. <laughs> I was like, hold on, this is a whole new life. Yeah. Like, how, <laughs> why didn't anybody tell me about this? Yeah. Those women, man. But I, I had an interest, I've had an interesting um, sports, say, career exposure because after that, I went went to cycling and like road biking, road racing, mm. and competed at that. So I've always been in some sort of competition mindset. Nice. What are you planning on doing now? Any marathons or anything? No, 
<laughs> no, I mean, since the military, it's like I've broken my legs three times. Oh, sh four shoulder surgeries and had a number of other surgeries. And Holy crap. It hurts. So that medical retirement, it wasn't just one incident. It was just a comp compilation. Yeah. Of I mean, those are the surgeries like being blown up, shot, everything, you know, landing hard at night, doing skydives and jumping it, whole combination of things. Oh, wow. So when you were skydiving, you the parachute didn't go off in time or something? No, I mean, I never had a, a double malfunction, which the two parachutes in there, there's a main and reserve. Yeah. I definitely had some malfunctions with mains before and had to have some cutaways. Mm. But it's more landing at night. Um, I'll just say in the middle of the desert. Can't see. Can't see normally. And I mean, you have night vision, but still hit the ground hard. That is scary. So you're literally jumping out of a plane. It's pitch black and you don't really know what you're landing on. <laughs> sometimes that is crazy yeah, sometimes uh training usually you at least know kind of landmarks where you're gonna land but sometimes those trees look real small until you get to them and <laughs> they're like 15 foot cactus damn and that's yeah. nuts and if you get injured no one will even really know because it's black and dark out real world i mean there's all comms and th there's contingencies too like training wise there's control measures like you get injured there's planes in the sky usually you land together so okay yeah how big was your screen. group that you were landing with on these i mean it ranged um nothing bigger than you know probably 30 20 people okay it's a pretty tight squad yeah and you were with shipley during these um some him and i split apart we went to different groups sorry you good <laughs> um dj and i went to different teams when we went to development groups so a lot of our time was spent apart uh, during those years hmm. but we're both always big into skydiving in there and would do it on the weekends and and push our limits there nice yeah. where's your favorite spots to skydive at eloy. eloy eloy arizona in between tucson and phoenix okay they have the world's best skydivers and the most consistent weather um for the most jumps uh, each day mm. and it attracts people from all around the world wow anything it's pretty close by here yeah I gotta check it yeah. out i've it, never done skydiving but it's on my list got to go and go there like they're tandem masters everybody world class okay best. i like trying new activities yeah that one's been a fear of mine but i need to conquer it you getting the wind tunnel yet wind tunnel is that the indoor one yeah yeah they have one here i, I haven't jump in there you'd recommend that first it's it's a great training tool um and you can expedite kind of your learning curve there because mm. you talk about going skydiving it takes probably 15 minutes to get a the airplane ride up, skydive for a couple of minutes, canopy come down. Hopefully you land safely. <laughs> uh, I mean that was probably forty five minutes. And you got one jump. Okay. But if you jump in the wind tunnel for ten minutes, you got ten jumps. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I'll try that first. You ever do the squirrel one where you wear the squirrel I haven't. costume? Um, I've I've known a lot of world class skydivers that have died, and if they're dying doing that stuff, <laughs> I'm good. I, I can yeah. push my limits other ways, but I don't need to fly in proximity to cliffs and everything else. Okay, so you have your limits. Yeah, now, especially now, like probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Might have kept pushing that limit, but kids, wife. Um, it's different now. Yeah, I'd like to manage not trying to kill myself yeah, doing yeah. something like that. It's funny. Any any fears you have? I hate bees and snakes. Bees and snakes. <laughs> and you, you, you've done a lot, and that's your fear. I got attacked, <laughs> I got attacked by like three different swarms when I was a little kid. Growing up cutting the grass, and I just hate bees. PTSD. Oh yeah, from bees. Yeah, yeah if you're some people are allergic to bees, so yeah, that's yeah. A, that's a legitimate. Bees fear and I'd snakes. Say. Snakes, I'd say snakes are a bit irrational because yeah. they're not a common animal. But I'm I'm cool with, with sharks. Okay, I, that's I, interesting. I, I got I got to go diving with sharks. Um, there's an awesome couple, Juan and uh, Ocean Ramsey. She's been labeled like the shark whisperer, mm. and the way they break down the knowledge of sharks and how they control the water column. They really kind of break every um, horrible rumor about them. Really? Yeah. So when you say water column, what exactly are they doing? So like the depth of the, of the water. So, you know, three feet, mm -hmm. 10 feet, however that is. And the alpha type shark will can be at the top of the water column. Mm. And they can tell, like, yeah, I can tell if a shark's hungry. Like apparently you can see when there's ribs and they kind of compare it to, um, pit bulls, like okay. everybody thinks a pit bull is going to eat you. Yeah. It's like if you kind of break it down, you know, when it, a dog brings its ears back, sharks have 
sort of the same telltale signs in, in different ways. Wow. So, so you were like in a cage down there with them? No cage. No cage? No cage. Dude, that's crazy. No cage. What if you saw one that was hungry? I was relying on them <laughs> to <laughs> identify those and, and hopefully not get eaten. And I mean, they gave a, a few key things. You're like, try not to have your back turned to them. Yeah. So you're kind of consistently swimming like 360 wow. degrees around. Is it true you're supposed to punch them in the nose if they come at you? They definitely said to push push their nose if push they the get nose. closed and push them off. So that's like a sensitive spot on yeah. them? Wow. Yeah, you see the statistics. They actually don't kill that many people as, mm -hmm. as people think. A lot of the bites are saying the sharks may get excited because, you know, they're splashing or whatever. So a lot of the bites, like they're just testing it to see if like it is food or not. Mm. Unfortunately, some of those bites are catastrophic, but right. a lot of them aren't attacks it's more they're curious wow so did you have a snake incident as well no i just don't like them. you just don't like them <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people fear snakes some of them yeah. get big so yeah. those ones i fear yeah some of the ones in the amazon those big <laughs> ones <laughs> they're all over florida too yeah yeah damn is that where you're at no right virginia oh you're still in yeah. virginia yeah so you don't ever want to move out of there i definitely would but a lot of our family's there so my wife's parents, my parents, mm. kids. So get them through high school and pick somewhere else. We spend some time in Florida. Yeah. So enjoy How that How old place. are the, the kids right now? They're 11, 8, 6, and 5. The 11, 8-year-old are, are from my ex-wife and I. So okay. we have a, a nice blended family. <laughs> uh, the 5 and 6-year-old are from my wife and I. Nice. And, uh, you know, I had to have somebody push me around in a wheelchair. So oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we'll have them four. So, so one of them will grow up and, and take care of me. Okay. Any military yeah. aspirations for your kids? I want them to pick whatever makes them happy. Nice. If they want to go in the military, cool. I'll definitely give them my personal take on some expectation management. But whatever makes them happy, I'm good with. Yeah. 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 Some parents really forced it on them, you know. Yeah. Kids. I mean, I, I try and if they're interested in something, make sure that they commit to a season yeah. and I see it through. But I'm... I'm not going to be one of those things like you got to be the best at whatever you want to try. Yeah. Like give them the opportunity and exposure. And if they naturally want to do it, awesome. Nice. How's the school system in Virginia? Good. Um, two of my kids go to private. The other two that, that live about an hour away go to a, a public school, but both good. Okay. They all have their um, hurdles. Yeah. It's cool to see your perspective of both systems, private yeah. and public. Yeah. It's interesting. Everything that they get after school activities, um, different educational opportunities. Cause I mean, one's in, in middle school now and the other three are in elementary and to kind of see the difference, mm. um, in all of them. Yeah. How's the, uh, the business doing Uh GBRS group, right? Yeah. GBRS group is good. Uh, we're about to hit five years in, in September it's grown really fast. Um, so always adding to the infrastructure and learning mm -hmm. and growing, um, it, it's been a huge learning curve, but it, it's doing really well. That's cool, um, man. We have, we're have we lucky we have an awesome team. We've been fortunate. It's been pretty organic w with that team, um, but kind of got to a level now where it's like those strategic professional people that have the experience is, is what we need. Yeah. But I've been, been super lucky. I think your company mission really resonated with people. Yeah. Uh, you know, we started started at the end of 2019 we really wanted to pass on our experience and knowledge to the, to the next generations uh, to make them better, safer, make our communities better, safer, um, w whether it was law enforcement teams or just kind of the two-way community as well. But, you know, we learned a lot of lessons in blood where a lot of people lost their lives. Mm -hmm. We thought we could add value back to those next generations and kind of discuss and be an open book. Like we weren't perfect, but kind of discuss how we handled uh, transitions or losses, um, marriages, kids, and and our, a lot of our references aren't in the right way. Mm. So we, yeah, and no one will talk about it. Like yeah, we grew yeah. up in, like don't talk about it, drink about it, or do whatever you need to. Just show up and perform. Um, and all that that may work short term, long term. You know, there's a lot of long term effects when you're done with all of it. And mm. You look back, it's like, well, my family's gone. I have no relationship with my kids. Right. You know, a mixture of different things. So we really want to help and be honest. Um, and give real world references, not, not a theory. Yeah. That's important stuff to talk about. Cause yeah, these veterans come back and there's major mm -hmm. family issues and social issues yeah. fitting into society. Yeah. So it's cool to see you really do that, man.
yeah, it, it's been enjoyable. And, and the letters and messages we get, it's crazy. It's it's all around the world. Wow. But I mean, just people find dark times and to be able to talk about it or at least have a reference um, and see somebody talking about it, you know, you're not alone. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a worse thing when you're going through trauma. You feel like you're alone and no one can resonate with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that so. community aspect is major, I think, just mm -hmm. having like-minded guys that go yeah. through the same thing you went through. Yeah, and it's a diverse team. I mean, we got all different branches of the military, people there, all different ages. Mm. Um, it is a great team, a very diverse team. So although I may not have an experience, you know, one of the other people at our team may and, right. and can really help. So That's cool, man. Anything else you want to end off with or promote, man? No, I uh, I appreciate the time. Absolutely, uh, it was good. So that was fun, man. Thanks for coming yeah. on. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for watching, guys. See you tomorrow.